<laughs> right, this is Brother Beres with speaking. <laughs> Actually, I sometimes sort of think, like sometimes the way we speak as Christians is a bit weird because I have never, I mean, I have got a a brother who is my brother of my parents. I have never called him Brother Christopher. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, well, it's lovely to see yet more new faces here. And uh, let me just fill you in a bit. You've, in fact, tonight come on right on on the tail end of a series that we've been doing on the whole area of salvation and what the Bible teaches about it. Uh, this is the 22nd talk in the series, so we've been doing it pretty thoroughly. And the way we've tackled this, if you like, is that we've been looking at what I've called past salvation, present salvation and future salvation. And what we've been seeing is that past salvation is what the Bible teaches about being set free from the penalty of sin. And it's past salvation because that was done once and for all when Jesus died on the cross. And we've seen that the, the biblical jargon for that is that it's called justification, to be delivered or saved from the penalty of sin. And we have seen as well that that was accomplished through Jesus' death. We then moved on in stage two of this series to look at what I called present salvation. That is, what is going on in the present moment of time? What we are experiencing from the moment we get converted to the moment of our death and or the rapture. And we've seen that present salvation, past salvation set us free from the penalty of sin, that issue is now settled once and for all, but present salvation, the Lord goes on to deliver us from the power of sin. And that is what the Bible calls sanctification. And we've seen that whereas to be set free from the penalty of sin was by Jesus' death, the process of being set free from the power of sin is through Jesus' resurrection. The fact that he's alive and can live through us. Now, we are now currently in the third phase of all this. And we're looking at what I've called future salvation. And we've seen that future salvation is what is still waiting that we're going to get after death in the future. And we've seen that the technical Bible word for that is glorification. And it means that one day we're actually going to be set free from the very presence of sin and are going to be made sinless. And that this, as we are seeing, is through the agency, not of Jesus' death, not of Jesus' resurrection, but through the agency of Jesus' return. Now, we're in this third phase now, and we've covered in great detail in the last few series what happens when you die, etc., etc. I'm not going to go over that again. And that the last two studies we did is that we concentrated on the rapture, that time when Jesus will come and he will take his church back to heaven, and that is when the church gets glorified bodies. That is also the seven-year period where the Great Tribulation, as the Bible calls it, takes place on the earth, and the rise of the Antichrist, the pouring out of God's judgments upon the earth. And we've been looking, the last study and this one, at the two things that happen to us while we are in heaven, while the Great Tribulation is going on down on earth. And the first thing we saw last time is that it's during that seven year period after the rapture when we've all got our glorified bodies that we all stand before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the rewards for anything that he has been able to do through us. Now the second thing that we're going to look at tonight and this is right at the end of that seven year period is that there is in fact a marriage in heaven. If you go to Revelation and chapter 19. Remember I've said before that Revelation from chapter 6 onwards is a chronological account of the events that happen from the time of the rapture onwards, you see. And Revelation 6 through to, verse, uh, to chapter 19 
is an account of the Great Tribulation, and then in chapter, at the end of chapter 19, you have the Second Coming. Now, we're going to read verses just before the Second Coming, and we're going to read verses 6 to 9. <clears throat> and John says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of mighty thunder peals, crying, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty, reigns. <clears throat> Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to be clothed with fine linen, bright and pure, uh, and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now what we need to understand is we know that the Lamb is Jesus, but what we've got to understand that his bride at this marriage that takes place in heaven right at the end of this seven years is the marriage of the church of Jesus Christ to Jesus. Jesus being the bridegroom, the church being the bride. Let's see this. If you go to Ephesians, Ephesians in chapter 5, and from verse 21 onwards, Paul gives the instructions uh, for how to live with each other in the context of of marriage and that what he does is he says the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church etc etc and he talks about marriage the distinctive thing about marriage being the fact that two people become whilst retaining their individuality one flesh it's kind of you know the fact that in marriage one plus one equals one it's it's an extraordinary thing in the same way that with the Trinity, one plus one plus one equals one. So that two people become absolutely one flesh as one person before God, yet retaining their individuality. And in verse 32, having spoken about marriage, Paul says this is a great mystery, and I take it to mean Christ and the church. And Paul here draws a, a kind of a parallel between earthly marriage and the church the reason being that one day the church is going to be married to jesus if you go to 2 corinthians 2 corinthians chapter 11 <clears throat> and in verse 2 listen to what paul says <clears throat> he says i feel a divine jealousy for you for i betrothed you to christ to present you as a pure bride to her one husband and what Paul is saying, that I have been used by God to bring you Corinthians into the kingdom, you're Christians now, and in so doing, you are now betrothed to Jesus. You are one day, corporately, going to be Jesus' wife. So at the end of, of this seven years in heaven, we've had the rapture, we receive our glorified bodies. We're in heaven for the seven years, the judgment seat of Christ, and then right at the end, just before the second coming and Jesus' return to establish his kingdom and to reign on earth for a thousand years, immediately before that and just before it, we have the marriage of Jesus to the church. And the reason is quite simply this. You see, the thing is that by that time, we're all going to have glorified bodies. We're sinless. We're just like Jesus by then. But in marriage... We are going to experience the ultimate in being one with Jesus. Can you see that? In marriage, a husband and wife become literally one flesh before God. And at the end of the seven years after the judgment seat of Christ, that we're actually going to be married to Jesus, representing the fact that we're going to come into such oneness with him that it's beyond anything that we can comprehend now. Obviously, we're one with Jesus now by virtue that we've been incorporated into him, but there's going to be an eventual oneness between us and Jesus that at the moment we just can't even begin to comprehend an intimacy between us and the Lord that is, is beyond even trying to think of at the moment. And in order to understand precisely the details about this marriage of the church to Jesus, we need to just quickly get an understanding 
of the way in which a Hebrew Old Testament wedding took place. <coughs> now, the way that they did it in the Old Testament was this, that when it came for a son who reached manhood and was, you know, sort of time to get him married, that what happened was is that the, 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 the groom's father would choose a bride for his son. He would make the choice as to who it's going to be. But having done that, the wife or the intended bride, she is still free to decline the offer. She doesn't have to do it. But the groom, the father of the groom, decided who he was going to marry, and then the woman concerned could either say yes or also she had the right to say no as well. But if she said yes, it was at that moment of the betrothal, even though they weren't then married, that they were tied in in total commitment and for the Jews even if you're only at the engagement point it took a divorce in order for you to come out of that relationship so as far as the Jews were concerned they didn't have engagement the father would choose his son's bride if the bride was happy if that woman was happy with that the moment she agreed to marry him then they were betrothed to each other, but it wasn't an engagement, because an engagement is almost like a trial period, and one is free to back out with honour. Not so for the Jews, that it took a divorce to actually get you out of that commitment. So the point was, they're not now, in, uh, they're not now married yet, but they are betrothed to each other, which is absolutely binding. There was no engagement. Now, what happened, when the date came for the actual wedding, when they were actually going to become man and wife, what happened was, is that the groom then went to the bride's house, where she was waiting for him with her friends, her bridal party. And what happened was that the groom took his intended wife, his betrothed wife, took her away from her home and took her back to his home. And it was as he did that, that they were married. There was none of this with this ring, I thee wed, and all that stuff. That, that's not how they did it. So the marriage took place as the groom took his betrothed from her home and took her back to his home. That was the actual marriage. And when the groom went to the, the, her home, to bring her back to his home, she would be all decked out in all the robes and everything like that ready for him. And then as soon as they got back to his home, there was a massive wedding feast. The wedding feast, as they used to call it. Now that's how the Jews in the Old Testament practiced getting a wife. He who finds a wife finds a good thing, absolutely. And that was how they did it in Old Testament times. Now what I want to do is to compare that with the marriage that there's going to be between ourselves as the church and Jesus. Now firstly, we saw in a Jewish wedding that the father chooses the bride. Well that's absolutely the same, isn't it? Because the reason that we're Christians is that God drew us. Can you see he drew us? I mean, the Lord's reaching out to everybody. It's not that he chooses some and not others to be saved. But it's the Lord who draws us. And all of us here who got converted only became Christians because the Lord himself enabled us to become Christians. We did take a free will decision, and yet it's not quite that simple. God had to work in us in advance before we were even free to make that free will decision. So therefore, this is the same. The father chooses the bride. But it's more than that, because do you remember that when the father chose a bride for his son, the bride could say no? Well, that's the same, because the offer of salvation goes out to absolutely everybody, and yet many decline the offer, don't they? People can reject Jesus if they want to. <coughs> now, we saw as well that as soon as the woman agreed to marry the man, that that was when they were betrothed. That was when the commitment started, and it was irrevocable. It couldn't be undone. Now, our betrothal, as we've read in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, I betrothed you to Christ. He's talking to people he led to the Lord. The moment that we were converted, we were individually, as part of the corporate church, we were betrothed to Jesus. And remember, the Jewish betrothal was irrevocable. 
you cannot lose your salvation. Of course you can't lose your salvation. You cannot undo this commitment. It's something that God has done. It can't be changed. Salvation cannot be lost. The betrothal was irrevocable. All right. Now then, also, what we have here is that, remember, the groom went to the bride's home and he collected her from her home and she was all decked out in the wedding dress, etc., etc. Now, here, in the marriage of Jesus to the church, we have this. The groom comes from his home to the bride's home to take her back to his home. Well, that's what, exactly what the rapture is, isn't it? Uh, the, rapture of the, church, uh, the rapture of the church, Jesus comes and he takes all his people back to heaven with him. So, here, Jesus, as the groom, comes to earth at the rapture and he takes his bride, us, back home to his home in heaven. But there's one difference here, because in the Jewish wedding, that would be the actual point that they were married. Now, it's slightly different here, the reason being that in order to be married, the bride has to be all decked out in her wedding garments. But as we saw last time, we, as the church, we don't get the wedding garments until after the judgment seat of Christ. Because it's the very rewards we receive there that make up the wedding garments, as it were, the robes of righteousness, etc., etc. So therefore, Jesus as the groom comes to earth at the rapture, takes us as his bride back to his home, but the marriage is not in that action. The marriage comes later because first the bride has to be decked out. All right. Now then, so the marriage is actually takes place at the groom's home in heaven. All right. Now then, there's another difference here as well, because in the Jewish wedding, when the groom went to get his bride and he literally carried her away back to his home, it was then that they had the marriage feast. The marriage feast was always at the bride, at the groom's home. Now, it's different here because as we're going to see that Jesus comes and he takes the church back to heaven and then there is the marriage. But the feast, the marriage feast, is not in heaven. It's not at the groom's home. In actual fact, as we're going to see, especially the next time that we do this series, the marriage feast is back on earth. And when Jesus comes at the second coming, he brings us back, and the marriage supper of the Lamb is on earth. And remember, it's the second coming that kicks off the thousand-year reign of Jesus on earth when the kingdom of God is finally established. Now, the reason for this is because God has decided that one day heaven is actually going to land on earth. So it's not going to be a question of either living in the bride's home or in the groom's home. One day, as we will see next time, God's home, heaven, is actually going to land and remain permanently on earth. So we're going to live in both our homes. We're going to live in our home as the bride, and we're going to live in Jesus' home as the groom at the same time, because heaven is eventually, literally, going to come down on earth. Now then, so what we've got is this. The groom collects the bride, his betrothed, from her home. That's the... That's us on earth, all right? He comes, he collects us from our home on earth. But he doesn't take her friends back. Now, that will become clear later, because we're going to see the different parties. There's the bride's party, there's the groom's party, there's the groom, and there's the bride herself. And we're going to see how different people fit in to these different roles. So, Jesus comes from his home, heaven, to earth at the rapture, takes us back to his home. All right. So, now we're in heaven. But when the groom collected the bride in a Jewish wedding, the groom's party, his friends, accompanied him everywhere. And we're going to find out who they are in just a few moments. So he takes us back to heaven. During the seven years, there's the judgment seat of Christ, and then the wedding actually takes place. The wedding having taken place, we then all come back down to earth with him at the second coming, and then you have the marriage feast. Now, what we're going to do now <coughs> is we're going to sort out the personnel who are involved in all this. All right. You see, the personnel of this, we've got a groom at a wedding, and you've got the groom's party. 
don't you? You have the friends of the groom, all right? Then you have the bride, and then you have the bridal party. You have the bride's party, the friends of the bride. And now we're going to see who the different groups of people and believers throughout history, where each of them fit in to all this. Now, first of all, the groom is Jesus. Well, that's straightforward. We knew that. The bride is the church. That's us. That is quite straightforward. Now, who are the groom's friends? Who are these guys who follow Jesus around everywhere he goes? Who is it that comes with Jesus at the rapture and then back to heaven with him? They're with him all the time. They are his friends, the friends of the groom. Who exactly are they? Well, I'll tell you. They're two groups of people. The first group of people is that they are all the Old Testament believers. They're all the believers who died prior to Jesus being raised from the dead. If you go to um, John chapter 3... John chapter 3, and this is something that John the Baptist says. Because remember, although John the Baptist appears in the New Testament, he was the last of the Old Testament prophets. All right. Now, listen to what he says. Um, <coughs> John 3, 29. He says, He who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice, Therefore, this joy of mine is full. And John the Baptist knew that because he was still of the Old Testament dispensation, that therefore he was one of the groom's friends. He wasn't part of the church. He wasn't part of the church. He wasn't part of the... He wasn't the bride. He was the friend of the groom. And then the second group of people who are the friends of the groom are all the believers who are martyred during the Great Tribulation. Because they also are not part of the church. Because at the rapture, just before the great tribulation starts, at the rapture, the church is taken back to heaven. Then the Lord starts to move and re-evangelizes the earth again through Israel, because then Israel, whom we have replaced temporarily, are grafted back in. And then loads, millions of people get converted during the seven years of the Great Tribulation on earth. But those of them who die under persecution and who therefore go to heaven because they've died, they are also the friends of the groom. If you just turn to... um. Revelation chapter 7, we'll just have a quick look at these guys. Well, they're not all guys, they're going to be women there as well. Revelation chapter 7, I don't want to get accused of sexism, do I? Well, that's right. I mean, I get oppressed enough by women. <laughs> right, Revelation 7. <coughs> Revelation 7 and uh, verse 9. Uh, he says, After this I looked, and there was a great multitude, which no man can number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. So there are all these people, and there are you know, countless numbers of people up there. Now then, if you go down into verse 13, Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these clothed in white robes, and whence have they come? And I said to him, Sir, you know. So John is now going to find out who this great army of people are. Are they the church? No, they're not. Look, these are they who have come out of the great tribulation. So therefore, <coughs> we have the groom is Jesus. The bride is us, because we are part of the church. The groom's friends, or the groom's party, comprise of Old Testament believers, up to John the Baptist, plus all believers who are martyred during the Great Tribulation, all right, and, um, and who get killed during that time. Okay, right. Now then, therefore, who are the bridal party? Who, who are the friends of the bride? My, 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 who's left? Well, I'll tell you who's left. Because remember, the friends of the bride are always located at the bride's home, because that's where the bride comes from. The friends of the bride are those believers who survived the Great Tribulation. These are people who got converted during the Great Tribulation, and they survive it. And there's going to be millions of them. So the believers who are still alive at the Second Coming, they constitute 
being the friends of the bride. And they are alive and they are waiting there when Jesus returns to earth, bringing um, the church with him. All right. Now then, let's go to Revelation 19. And let's just clarify exactly where we are. Revelation 19. Let's read verse 9 again. Remember, this is immediately prior to the second coming. From Revelation 6 up to Revelation, the end of chapter 18, you have a chronological account of the events on the earth during the Great Tribulation. At the beginning of verse 19, you have the marriage of the church to Jesus in heaven. But in verse 11 through to the end of chapter 19, it's the second coming. Then I saw heaven opened and a white horse. And if you read through that, that is the second coming of Jesus. And immediately before that second coming is this marriage of us to Jesus in heaven. Now then, the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to see it's the marriage supper of the Lamb that kicks off the thousand year reign of Christ on earth. Soon as Jesus returns, he judges people, he deals with all the judgments, and then you have the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now then, who are those invited? Let's, let's clarify this. First of all, there are the friends of the groom who are invited. And remember, we've seen that they are the Old Testament saints, and they are the believers who died during the Great Tribulation. And in prior studies that we've done, we've seen as well that it's at the second coming that they are raised from the dead, and they get their glorified bodies. And you need a body to be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the reason is because there's food there. Can you see? So this, we've seen, is the moment when the Old Testament believers, plus the believers who died in the tribulation, they get their glorified bodies. They are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Now, the other group who are invited, because obviously the groom is Jesus and we are the bride. I mean, that goes without saying. So we've seen the groom's friends, who they are, they are invited. Now, the other group of people who are invited are the friends of the bride. Now, who are the bridal party? The, bri the bridal party are the believers who are still alive at the second coming. So because they're still alive, they've still got bodies. And it's they who repopulate the earth during the millennium. They are the ones, because they're still mortal, they're not glorified yet, they repopulate the earth whilst Jesus is reigning in the kingdom of God throughout the earth from Jerusalem. So then, therefore, they are invited. So what happens is that at the second coming, all right, Jesus comes, all right, and he lands on the earth. He brings with him his bride, us. He brings with him his party, the friends of the groom, the Old Testament believers, plus the believers who died during the Great Tribulation. And when he lands on earth, you see, we, the church, have already got our glorified bodies by then. Jesus got his 2,000 years ago, so he's taken care of. But the friends of the groom haven't. They're disembodied still. So they get their bodies there at that moment, all right? So then, then, the only people now to be sorted out are to get the friends of the bride, the believers alive at, at the second coming, to sort them out so the marriage supper of the Lamb can begin. But before that happens, the unbelievers who are alive, when Jesus comes again, they have got to be dealt with and disposed of. Let's see this. If you go to Zechariah, Zechariah and chapter 13. Now, what you've got to understand here is that finally, when it boils down to it, there are only two generic groups of people on this earth as far as God is concerned, and they're Jews and they're Gentiles, all right? So, first of all, we're going to see how God sorts out the unbelieving Jews from the Jews who have got converted. And in Zechariah chapter 13, and in verse 8... It says, in the whole land, and remember, Zechariah prophesied to Israel. This is referring to Israel. 
He says, in the whole land, says the Lord, two thirds shall be cut off and one third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire, refine them as one refined silver, test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them and I will say they are my people and, that, and they will say the Lord is my God. Now what we see here is that at the second coming, one third of all the Jews left alive on the earth are now believers. Can you see, two-thirds are cut off, because remember, Jesus kills all the unbelievers with only the believers remaining alive. And then if you go into John 3, <coughs> John chapter 3, and in verse 7, No, forget that, I've got the wrong verse now, forget that. So what we're seeing here is that Jesus comes and first of all, he gathers all Israel to him and he separates off the believers from the unbelievers. The unbelievers he kills, alright? The next group of people are the Gentile people. Jesus has to separate them out. He's got to separate the believers from the unbelievers. All right. And if you go to Matthew 25, <coughs> and we'll be back to here a bit later, Matthew 25, we have the parable of the sheep and the goats. <coughs> and in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 24 is the Great Tribulation. Chapter 25 are parables about the second coming and what happens when Jesus arrives. And in Matthew 25, verse 31, he says, When the Son of Man comes in all his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. Now that word nations in Greek, it's literally Gentile nations. So all the Gentiles alive are gathered now before Jesus. And what he does is he separates them. He has the sheep who are believers on one side and the goats who aren't believers on the other. And the way in which Jesus knows who are believers or who are not is absolutely fascinating. Because for we know that the believers, the sheep, were those who, you know, sort of said, Lord, we never saw you hungry, we never saw you naked, anything like that, you weren't in prison. And Jesus said, Whatever, whenever you did this to the least of my brethren, you did it to me. Now, remember, he's talking to Gentiles, all right? Now, during the Great Tribulation, the Jews are going to be persecuted even more than Christians, all right? Because Satan is even more determined to destroy Israel than he is the church, all right? So, because if he can destroy Israel, there'll never be a second coming, because the second coming won't happen until Israel pray for it, you see? So, what happens is here, that, that during the reign of the Antichrist, it's dangerous being a Jew. Now, there is only one group of people alive on the earth who are going to help the Jews and feed them when they're hungry and visit them when they're in prison and do all these things for them. Who are they going to be? They're going to be believing Gentiles who are going to do it because believers are told to love Israel with everything they've got. So when Jesus said, when you did it to the least of these my brethren, what did he mean? Who are Jesus' brethren? Well, the Jews are. Jesus is a Jew. All right? He wasn't before he came to earth in his pre-existence. But when he was born in that manger, Jesus, in that manger, Jesus became a Jew. And he is still a Jew. And we must never forget this, the unique position that Israel have. So therefore, what happens is that we now see that the Gentiles are sorted out, the unbelievers are killed, leaving the Gentiles who were following Jesus left alive. So then, we've got the two groups of people left, we've got believing Jews who've got converted, and we've got believing Gentiles who've got converted. It is they who are the friends of the bride. All right? And they are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb as well. And the millennium, the kingdom of God, because remember the kingdom of God is finally when all God's promises to Israel are fulfilled. The kingdom of God is the fulfilment of all the Old Testament promises to Israel. That is what the thousand year reign of Christ is all about. We are all part of that as we're going to see next time in a very powerful way. But nevertheless the kingdom of God is the Jewish Messiah reigning in Israel. That is what the thousand year reign of Christ is about. And it kicks off with the marriage supper of the Lamb.
And the people who are going to be there is the groom, Jesus, and the bride, us. The other people who are going to be there are the groom's party, the Old Testament saints and the tribulation martyrs. They've got glorified bodies just like us. The fourth group are the friends of the bride, who were all the Christians left alive who survived the Antichrist at the second coming. They have got mortal bodies, but nevertheless, they come to the marriage supper of the Lamb as well. And that is the personnel involved in all of this. And of course, all the unbelievers are alive at the second coming. Jesus kills them himself. So therefore, they're dead, they're down in Hades, and they await the great white throne judgment when they are raised from the dead and then thrown into the lake of fire. Now, having put that lot together... What we're going to do now is turn to some of Jesus' teaching about this and the parables that he gave. Uh, go back to Matthew chapter 25. Because one of the reasons that some parables give Christians such problems is that they don't understand the parables from the Jewish perspective. This is what you've got to do. And remember, one of the heresies going around in the church today is that the church has replaced Israel full stop and that God has finished with Israel. That is absolute rubbish as we're going to see a bit later on. The church has merely replaced Israel temporarily. Israel's place in God's kingdom is still absolutely assured. And in Matthew 25 we've got the parable of the wise and foolish virgins. And the reason that it's important to understand things like this is that this is one of the teachings of Jesus that people use to try and tell you that you can, under certain circumstances, lose your salvation. Now, let's have a look at this parable. Matthew 25, and we're starting from verse 1. We'll go through it a verse at a time. Now, the kingdom of heaven, in the Bible, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are synonymous terms, all right? synonymous terms, kingdom of heaven equals the kingdom of God, shall be compared, and remember Jesus is speaking this to Israel, he's teaching this to Jews, the kingdom of God shall be compared to ten maidens, not a good translation, the Greek word is parthenos, it's virgin, alright, to ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Now Jesus is saying here that there are ten virgins, alright, and they took their lamps to meet the bridegroom. Now, what you've got here is this. The picture that Jesus is using is of a royal Jewish wedding, all right? And that these virgins are part of the king's harem. Now, the king's harem, lucky man that he was. No, I don't mean that because I'm not in the slightest bit sexist. The king had the queen, his wife. He also had his concubines, all right? But on top of that, I mean the concubines were prostitutes. On top of that, he had virgins, and they had to be virgins, who served the king. They served him, but their job was to wait on the queen. All right? So in the king's harem, the personnel, you had the king, he had his queen, he had his concubines, and he had his virgins. They were all under his authority. Jesus is the bride, uh, the bridegroom. He's the, head, you know, he's the head of everything. They were all under his authority, but the virgins served the queen. All right. And the picture here is of the, the friends of the bride. The bridegroom has set out to collect his bride. All right. And they're all waiting for the couple to return so that the marriage feast can begin. That is the picture that we've got here. Now then, in verse 2, it says five of them were foolish and five were wise. Now the key to understanding this is to see that there are two categories of virgins here. Remember, these virgins are waiting on the coming of the groom with his bride. There are ten of them, but five are foolish and five are wise. Now, what you've got to understand is that the Jews are God's people. They haven't stopped being God's chosen people, in that sense, in any way at all. And that what we've got here is that the two groups of them are this. You see, the five wise virgins, as we're going to see, are those Jews alive during the tribulation who are waiting for Jesus to return because they have become Christians. They are believers. 
But what you have to understand as well is that the other five, the other five virgins, the foolish ones, they also are Jews alive just before the second coming, and they are also waiting for Messiah to come. But what you've got to bear in mind is this. The Jewish Messiah has already been once. The virgins who are wise are believers who know that he's coming again. The foolish virgins here are Jews who are waiting for Messiah because the Jews are waiting for their Messiah but haven't realised that he's already been. So can you see both groups are truly waiting for Messiah to come, aren't they? Because every unsaved, unbelieving Jew who's orthodox is waiting for Messiah to come. But they're unbelievers, they're not saved because they haven't believed on Jesus. They think their Messiah is someone else and that he hasn't come yet. So that what we've got here is the foolish virgins are Jews who haven't believed on Jesus, but who are nevertheless waiting for the Messiah, the groom, to come. The wise virgins are the Jews who have got converted and who are waiting for Jesus' second coming because they know that Messiah has already come once and they have believed on him. They have believed on Jesus. All right. So the point is that all ten of these virgins are virgins and in service of the king and waiting for the bride to come, the groom to come, Messiah, by virtue of being Jews. But only five of them are Christians. So these other five, who we see eventually end up in the lake of fire, this isn't Christians losing their salvation, that's ridiculous. It's unbelieving Jews, and as we go through this, I think you'll see it. Now in verse 3, we've got, when the, for the, when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. Now what's the picture here? Uh, in Matthew, Jesus says, let your light so shine before men. And that the light, the lantern, is the picture of our testimony before the world. All right. So these foolish ones who were unbelievers, they took their lamps, but they didn't have any oil. Now, what does oil represent? Oil represents the Holy Spirit. Can you see they're not born again? The lamp of their testimony, as we're going to see, is that they were Jews and they had the law of God. That is their testimony. And then if you go down into the next verse, verse 4, we read that, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. You see, because the wise ones are saved. They're born again of the Spirit. They know that the light of the world isn't us, it's Jesus living through us. And if you've got a lantern and light it, it's not the light... Of, it, it's not the lantern that's burning, it's the flame on the wick burning the oil that's burning. Can you see that? So therefore, the foolish ones have got their lantern, but no oil, alright? Because they're not born again, no Holy Spirit. Whereas the wise ones are born again, so they have got oil in their lamps. And then... Um, if you go down into verse, well, let's, let's just read through it. And the bridegroom was delayed, and they all slumbered and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, Behold the bridegroom, come out and meet him. So this is now the imminent second coming. Then all those maidens rose and trimmed their lamps. So all ten of them, all right, they realize that it's happening, Messiah is coming, all right, they trim their lamps. Now to trim the lamp means you get it ready for burning, and you light the wick, all right? So this is what they now do. And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. Now what's happened, I'll tell you. These foolish ones have lit their lamps, but in effect all you've got is the dry wick burning. Can you see? And if you've got a lantern with no oil in it, the wick will burn for a little while, but not for very long. Because it's got no oil in it. So what happens is, they go out to meet Messiah at the second coming, and what happens is they're like dims, and suddenly it's going out. And they say to the believers, oh, we need what you've got, and of course by then it's too late. It's too late for them. Now, what we need to see here is that the lamp is the testimony, the testimony of our lives. Now here, these Jews, because they're unbelievers, they think they're right with God because they're Jews. They think they're saved because they're Jews. 
And they're not saved. You're only saved by believing on Jesus. But what happens is they are self-righteous because they see themselves as being fulfilling the law and accepted by God on that basis. So they light their lamps and that lamp, that light that's burning, that flame coming out of the wick, that is their own self-righteous works and deeds. But what happens when Jesus comes? It goes out. And do you remember, right at the beginning of this course, when we looked at Adam and Eve and the fall, we saw that when they realised that they had sinned and were naked, they did the old fig leaves job, didn't they? That is man's attempt to cover sin, all right? And of course, what happened was that they do this, and they think this is great, but then when Jesus comes to find them, when they are actually confronted with Jesus in all, their, in, in all his glory, Jesus gives them skins of animals and they take them. Why? Because in the presence of Jesus you realise that your own self-righteousness is nothing. It might look good when Jesus isn't there, but compared to Jesus it's just absolutely nothing. And here are these unbelieving Jews with their little wick burning the flame of their own self-righteousness and suddenly here is Messiah, the light of the world himself, and what happens? Their flame goes out and they see that it's as nothing and they realise that it's too late. And they realise that because they haven't got oil, because they're not born again, they are are lost and that is why they said um, uh, and the foolish said to the wise give us some of your oil our lamps are going out they're saying give us salvation but of course at the second coming it's too late you see and the wise replied perhaps there will not be enough for us and for you go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves they're being facetious here they're saying, look, you thought that your own self-righteousness was okay. You thought that did the trick. Well, who knows? Shoot off and do a few more good works. And who knows? Perhaps there'll be enough righteousness to keep your lamp burning. Can you see? They're being facetious here. So that what we've got now is that these are of the foolish virgins are Jews alive at the second coming, but who aren't believers and who realize it too late. So what happens is that they now have to go off and try and find oil. So it off from the Jews who were already following Jesus and therefore saved. Now look at um, verse 10. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. So now you've got the second coming. The marriage feast begins, all right, and all the believers, all right, Jesus and us, the church, the Old Testament saints, the tribulation martyrs, plus all the believers who were still alive at the second coming, they all go in and they start the wedding feast that kicks off the second coming, all right? So then... And the door was shut. The foolish virgins, because they weren't saved, they're shut out. They can have no part of this whatsoever because they're not born again. And the only way to be saved is by believing on Jesus, the very thing that these Jews hadn't done. Therefore, they were lost. And when it says the door was shut, it reminds us of Noah's Ark. Do you remember the offer God was going to send a flood, destroy the whole earth. Noah built this ark and, and, and was preaching the gospel, all right, saying there's salvation, the flood is coming, judgment is coming, but there's salvation if you get into God's ark, all right. And the ark was open, but it was open to anybody, but only for a certain time. And on the day that the floods came, it says that God shut the door of the ark. <coughs> it was too late. For salvation they had refused to believe what the Lord was telling them therefore they were lost and that is precisely what's happening here these Jews have refused to believe on Jesus as their Messiah now they realize that Jesus is their Messiah because it's a second coming but it's too late it's absolutely too late and they're shut out and in verse 11 afterward the other maidens came also saying Lord Lord open to us and this is why people say that this is a picture of losing your salvation because they're saying Lord Lord open to us but he replied truly I say to you I do not know you all right and of course they're shut out and eventually they're lost now you see why is it that they are saying Lord Lord why are they calling Jesus Lord? 
Well, the reason is quite simply this. If you go to Matthew 7, Matthew chapter 7, and something that Jesus says, and again, this verse is used to demonstrate to people that you can lose your salvation, hence instilling fear into them. It says, Sir, Sir. It's, uh, it's Lord. Okay, it's Lord. Now, in Matthew 7, verse 21, he says, this is Jesus speaking, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, when do you enter the kingdom of heaven? At the second coming at the beginning of the thousand year reign of Christ. But he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, what is the will of God that you believe in his only Son? All right. On that day many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, and do many mighty works? Then I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. Now can you see, these two teachings of Jesus refer to the same time. Now why is it that people who are calling Jesus Lord are being kicked out? I'll tell you. Because in Philippians, Paul makes it absolutely clear that one day every knee is going to bow to Jesus and declare him Lord. And it happens on two occasions. It happens at the second coming with those unbelievers who are alive at the second coming, and then it will happen for every unbeliever when they're raised from the dead and stand before the great white throne judgment. So that what you've got here, you've got people who rejected Jesus, they didn't believe in him. Now, at the second coming, these Jews have no choice but to acknowledge that Jesus is Lord. They do so, but it's too late. It's too late for them to be saved. And the reason they said, Lord, we prophesied in your name, we cast out demons in your name. Well, the reason for that is the Jews, Judaism has always had prophets, and it has always had the casting out of evil spirits. Even in New Testament times, there were Jews who were going around doing exorcisms, but who weren't converted. Can you see what I'm saying? These guys who are calling Jesus Lord, but still getting kicked out, they are Jews alive at the second coming, who have been carrying on in their Judaism, all right, but who have never received Jesus as their saviour. At the second coming, they are compelled to acknowledge as Lord the one whom they had rejected as Lord and who they didn't want to know in any way at all. So therefore, calling Jesus Lord is only significant towards salvation if it's before the second coming. All right. At the second coming, calling Jesus Lord is something that every unbeliever has got no choice but to do. They will be made by God to do it. It doesn't mean that they're saved in any way at all. And when Jesus says to these guys, back in Matthew 25 now, when he says to these foolish virgins that... I say to you, I do not know you. The reason is that these Jews, like Israel in general at the moment, sought salvation by works. They thought that they would be saved just because they were Jews. They thought they were saved just because they had the law. And the teaching of the New Testament to Israel was, look, the law was not given so that by obeying it you could be righteous enough for God to accept you. The law was given to Israel purely to show them that they couldn't obey the law, were sinners and therefore needed salvation. Can you see the sin of Judaism as it stands today, ever since it turned against Jesus, is that of total unbelief and self-righteousness that they refuse to accept that salvation is only by trusting in what God has done, rather they're trusting to their own good works and trying to obey the law. So can you see these virgins? Can you see what it all means now? And that with the parables, you know when you've got the correct interpretation because every little bit falls into place. You know when someone's got a parable wrong and it's when they're taking little bits of it, spiritualizing it until it's unrecognizable and saying, this is what it means. Can you see what I mean? In order to know that you've got the interpretation of a parable right, every detail has got to fit literally into place. And can you see with this parable, I mean, you might have heard loads of interpretations of what it might or might not mean, but can you see every 
detail fits perfectly in place because this is precisely what Jesus was speaking about. Go now to Matthew 22. Let's see another parable that Jesus spoke about it. Matthew 22 and verse 1. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God, second coming, yep, got that. The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a marriage feast for his son. Well, does that ring bells? Who's the king? It's God. Who's the marriage between his son, Jesus, and the church? The marriage feast, marriage supper of the Lamb, beginning of the thousand year reign of Christ, it's all here. And he sent his servants to call those who were invited to the marriage feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, Behold, I've made my dinner ready, my oxen, my fat calves are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the marriage feast. But they made light of it, and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. Now, what's that? I'll tell you what that is. The offer of the kingdom was firstly to Israel. In John's Gospel it says Jesus came to his own people, but his own people received him not. Salvation is first to the Jew, as Paul says in Romans, only then, secondarily, to the Gentile. Jesus came because he wanted to establish the kingdom 2,000 years ago, but Israel rejected him as being Messiah. So when Jesus came at the first coming, at the incarnation 2,000 years ago, it was God holding his hand out to Israel and saying, come to the marriage feast, let the kingdom be established. But what happened was that Israel, God's own people, the very nation through whom salvation was supposed to come to the world, they rejected Jesus. They, you know, they had other things to do. Now look what happens. The king was angry and sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. What happened in AD 70 as a direct result of the Jews rejecting Jesus? The Roman army under Titus marched into Jerusalem and utterly destroyed it. The devastation of Jerusalem by the Romans in AD 70 was the direct result of Jesus' prophecy of judgment against them. And that is precisely this parable that Jesus is saying. So he came to Israel, his own people, but they rejected. The offer was first to Israel, and they rejected it. And because they rejected it, and because they treated him so badly, and because eventually they killed him and murdered him, therefore the king the father of the groom, Jesus was the groom, the father sent in his troops the Roman army, and that nation was destroyed. Now, verse 8, Then he said to the servants, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. He says, Israel can't come. Israel can't be part of this at the moment. Why weren't Israel worthy? Well, because God was saying it's by faith, Israel were doing it by works. That's why Israel isn't worthy. If you think salvation depends on what you do, you are unworthy to have salvation. When you have realised your utter worthlessness of anything you do to save you, then you are worthy to be saved. Can you see? It's God's upside down kingdom. Everything is turned upside down in the kingdom of God. So what happens here is that God now sends out and he says, right, those who were originally invited Israel, they don't want to come right I'm laying them aside. And what did he do? He invited the Gentiles, didn't he? He said, go to the thoroughfares. He said, and those servants went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good, so the wedding hall was filled with guests. And this is what's happening. What God is doing here is simply that because Israel rejected him, God said, I, for the time being, reject Israel. I go to the Gentiles. And so the Israel was cut out of God's vine. The church was grafted in in its place. And we are simply temporarily filling in for Israel. That's all 
Because at the rapture, we are taken and then Israel are grafted back in. And God carries on his plan through the ages, through Israel. They screwed up 2,000 years ago, they blew their chance. But only temporarily. We are merely the replacement for Israel. And it's at the rapture that Israel is, re uh, is grafted back in again. Let's actually see that. Go to Romans 11. We're going to go back to that parable in a minute, but let's just see. In Romans 11, just look very quickly at what Paul says. In verse 17, and remember, in the Romans, Paul is writing to Gentiles in the letter to the Romans. Verse 17, if some of the branches were broken off, and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in in their place to share the richness of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. So Paul is saying to the Gentiles, you have been grafted in to replace Israel. But if you go down... <coughs> to verse 23, look what he says. And even the others, if they do not persist in their unbelief, will be grafted in again. Who are the others? It's Israel. Uh, for, um, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you have been cut out from what is by nature a wild olive tree, and grafted, contrary to nature, into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will those natural branches be grafted back in into their own olive tree. The truth is we are unnatural branches. We should never have been there in the first place. Israel should have been. But we have temporarily replaced them. But after the rapture, then the natural branches, Israel, are going to be drafted, uh, grafted back in again. Now back to Matthew 7 and this parable. We've seen now God going to the Gentiles. All right. And what we read now... Uh, sorry, not no, it's Matthew 22, sorry. Matthew 22, and verse 11. Now look at this. But when the king came in to look at the guests, so the wedding feast is now going strong, isn't it? And the king comes in, he sees the wedding feast in progress. So now we are at the second coming, all right? He saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. There men will weep and gnash their teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. Now what Jesus is saying here is this, it's hypothetical. He's saying, even if a Jew managed to escape that judgment, he's saying that at the second coming, He's saying that even if you've got an unbelieving Jew, even if he manages to escape that judgment upon him, I mean, Jesus is, is talking hypothetically here, even if he manages to slip into the millennium unnoticed, he's going to be spotted. And the reason he's going to be spotted is because he won't have a wedding garment. Now, what is the wedding garment? The robe of righteousness, the righteousness of Christ that we have by faith. Remember, these unbelieving Jews at the second coming, they have no faith. They're into salvation by works, and of course, there's no way you can do it. So, therefore, he's spotted. I mean, Jesus is being facetious. He's saying unbelievers won't get in to the thousand-year reign of Christ. They won't get into the marriage feast. But he says even if one did, he'd be spotted and thrown out, you see, because he won't have the righteousness of Jesus by faith, and therefore is not acceptable to God. So therefore, he's kicked out. So again, can you see it, this separation all the time between believers and unbelievers at the second coming, whether they be Gentiles or whether they be Jews? And I think we've just got time, very quickly, if you go to Matthew 25 again, back to Matthew 25, I think we've got time to do this one. It's on a slightly different theme, but nevertheless, while we're doing these parables, and now we've got the wherewithal to understand them, we'll strike while the iron's hot, because these are the parables often used to try and tell you that you can lose your salvation. All right. Uh, later in the course, I'll be showing you how ridiculous that is. Right, okay, now, in verse 14, Matthew 25, verse 14, now, what you've got here is the parable about the talents. I won't read it all verse by verse, all right? But it will be as a man going on a journey called his servants and entrusted to them his, his property. And he gave 
five talents, he gave one five talents, another two to another one, all right? And of course, what happens is that the bloke with five talents uses them and makes more. The bloke with two talents uses them and makes more. The bloke with one talent buries it and does absolutely nothing. Now, what happens when the king returns, you see it's the second coming, all right? When the king returns, he says, he who received the five talents came forward, bringing five talents more, saying, Master, you delivered me five talents, here I have made five talents more. His master said, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little, I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And so he did with the bloke who had two talents, who made two more. Now what you've got here is this. This reminds us, does it not, of the judgment seat of Christ that the extent, the amount of authority that each one of us individually wields in the kingdom of God during the thousand year reign of Christ is going to be decided at the judgment seat of Christ according to our faithfulness down here. Now, you may be wondering, well, all right, the church stands before the judgment seat of Christ and gets rewarded. What about the others who aren't the church? This is when they get there rewards at the second coming and the rewards is exactly the same as for us all right the amount of authority that they have in the thousand year reign of christ so that what you've got here is that the guy with five talents he took it he used it he was a believer the bloke with two talents he did likewise now it's the bloke with one talent that interests us here look he also, uh, he also, who had received the one talent, came forward, saying, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you did not win us, win us, so I was afraid, and hid your talent in the ground. Now, remember, Jesus is speaking parables to Israel here. This is referring to the Israelites, the Jews, who are alive at the second coming. It's all to do with sorting out who the believers are and who the unbelievers are, you see. Now, now, the point is, this one Jew, he, he says to, to Jesus, you're a hard man. <laughs> he doesn't exactly love the Lord, does he? This guy is an unbeliever. But you might say, but he's got a talent. He must be a believer, he's got a talent. Well, now, we've got to think carefully here. What do the talents represent? You see, you've got to remember that Israel are unique. And the uniqueness of Israel and Jews is that they are God's people whether they are saved or not. Can you see that? Whereas for Christians, we're God's people only if we are saved. But the Jews are God's people by virtue of being Jews, but nevertheless need to receive Jesus in order to be actually saved. Now this makes them unique. What are the talents here that every Jew has at least one of? I'll tell you, the unique thing about Israel is that they had the law. They had what God called the uh, what Paul called the oracles of of God. Israel's position was unique because they, among all other people in their history, have the greatest advantage towards getting saved that anyone has. Their whole Old Testament history, which they all believe, the ones who are actually orthodox, their whole Old Testament history was simply there to point to Jesus. And when the Jews killed Jesus, they knew that he was the Messiah. They knew it. We'll be touching on that in two or three studies' time. They knew that he was the Messiah and still rejected him. So the point is that every Jew has a talent. Every Jew has the knowledge of God in an absolutely unique way. But the guy with five talents... You see, he turned to the oracles of God and he believed and acted on them. He was saved. He received Messiah. He had realized that the whole Old Testament screamed Jesus in every verse. The guy with two talents had done likewise. He as a Jew had the oracles of God, but he'd done something about it. But the guy with one talent, what did he do? He buried it. Can you see, he turned his back on what he had that was enough in order for him to believe on Jesus. Can you see, it's a picture here of an unbeliever. This guy wasn't saved. 
So the Lord says, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has the ten talents. For to everyone who has will more be given, and he will have abundance. But from he who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Remember, in the thousand year reign of Christ, all of us who have, that's salvation, we have it. But we'll be given even more, because we'll be given a place in the kingdom of God. But all the unbelievers, they have not. They haven't got salvation, but even what they haven't got is going to be taken away because they therefore have no part in the kingdom of God either. Can you see these parables are concerning Jews who are alive at the second coming and who are not saved? And it says, and cast the worthless servant into outer darkness. Why? He was an unbeliever. Therefore, his eventual fate after the great white throne is to actually be cast into the lake of fire. So can you see what we've had here? We have seen that you have the rapture and the church is taken to heaven with Jesus. For that seven years, the tribulation, the antichrist and God's judgments and the restoration of Israel is all happening on the earth. We stand before the judgment seat of Christ, all right, and we receive rewards. Then comes the marriage of the church to Jesus, the marriage of the church uh, of the church to the Lamb. Then the second coming, Jesus returns to earth, we come with him as his bride, okay? All the unbelievers on the earth are then killed, leaving the believers who are alive at the second coming to repopulate the earth. The, all the rest of us have got glorified bodies, Jesus has, the church has at that time, and the Old Testament saints and the believers who were killed during the reign of the Antichrist. But the believers who were alive at the second coming, they're mortal, but they repopulate the earth for the thousand year reign of Christ. And it is the marriage feast of the Lamb that kicks off the millennium. The whole thing starts with this massive, massive party. Do you remember at the Last Supper, when Jesus was sharing the Passover feast with the disciples and at one point he put the cup down and he said I shall not drink again of the fruit of the vine until I drink it afresh with you in the kingdom of God I mean we've got to stop spiritualizing the Bible that is literally true the next time that Jesus drinks wine with his disciples will be at the marriage supper of the Lamb Jesus will actually sit there with us and we will all have a massive Passover feast together at the marriage feast of the Lamb. It is quite literal, perfectly literal. These things are going to happen. And I'll tell you, it's far more exciting than the nebulous mysticism that those Christians preach, and I can't work out exactly what they mean, who don't believe these prophecies literally. They are literal and each one of them are going to be fulfilled. So the millennium kicks off with a party for all believers with Jesus. And it's going to be absolutely unbelievable. It's going to be a wedding feast par excellence. And if the tribulation is called by the Bible a time of trouble, such as the world has never seen, then the marriage supper of the Lamb is going to be a party, the like of which the Lamb, you know, this, this world has never seen. So next time, what we move on to, because we're, we're very near the end of this course now, the next time that we do this course, we're going to take it right to the end, and next time we're going to be looking at the millennium itself, what happens, what, what, what sort of world is it going to be, what are we all going to be doing, and then we're going to take it right through to the destruction of the universe, the new universe being created and the eventual eternal state and next time we're going to take that right through to the end and that will be it as far as stage three future salvation is concerned but don't get too excited because there will be another few studies phase four after that to tie up some loose ends so anyway that's what we'll be doing next time so uh, I hope that helps thank you for listening <laughs>